Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jen Taylor Campbell. I'm a birth and bereavement doula, as well as an adoption and surrogacy doula. Doula means woman who serves. And although I love happy births, adoptions, and surrogacy, the pro bono part of my business is in bereavement. I'm here to help you. I'm also mom of 18, yes, 18 children, with over 30 years experience in the trenches as a mom myself. We have a huge blended family, and I've also experienced the loss of our adult son. Remember, give a shout out to those brave enough to share their stories on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents podcast. I'm your host, Jen Taylor Campbell, and I have with me Shelly Knight. Shelly, how are you doing? All right, thank you. So you have a different accent than I do, which people, (laughs) it's barely perceptible, but where are you right now? So I'm kind of slap bang in the middle of the Midlands. I'm here in Northampton. I know you've got Northampton over there in America, but I'm Northampton of the Northamptonshire here in the UK. I love it. Awesome. Well, welcome. I've been on your podcast before. We've actually known each other for a couple, well, known each other. You know, I haven't flown over to see you yet, but we've known each other for a couple of years and um, we're going to talk about your journey. So I don't know where you want to start in having children. I know you have four, so spoiler alert, she does have four, but I want to get to where you were able to start having kids and your journey with that. Yeah, so I think we're probably all a little bit guilty of this, that you never really want anything until you can't have it. And so I never really thought about having children. It was never on my to-do list. It was very much ego-led life. I was like a nurse. I wanted to get to the top of my grades and do all of that. And then it was during... A smear, very attractive thing. I don't be calling smears over there in the USA, but like, like a pap test. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and they sort of always say, "So when was your last period?" And I was like, "Oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago," which apparently wasn't the normal answer. <laughs> and uh, so then she said, "Well, I think you're going through the early menopause," and I was kind of like 31 at the time. And then when you give that kind of information, like actually parenthood might not be an option for you it's like anything isn't it you suddenly really want it and think it's your birthright and everything like that and so that was kind of I suppose that how it all started I was just qualified as a nurse and as they want to go down the career path but then I there's this big hint that I probably couldn't have children if I did it was going to be a struggle and so then I wanted children and unfortunately I don't think we talk about this enough do we but you know it's all wasn't sort of like so then I decided to have children then we had four and it was lovely that's my life (laughs) it was literally like a decade of hell to complete the family and I say complete because as you said spoiler alert I do have four children Um, but my dream was to have about seven maybe 11 who knows maybe not 18 like yourself like superwoman that you are no most but, most uh, people aren't don't want that but you went from not wanting to have kids at all to wanting to have a huge family yeah I think it was one of those plot twists you get in life isn't it so I would have gone along and been this sort of like super nurse um maybe who knows <laughs> but there is more to life we don't realize do we until we have these really challenging times these times that almost break us and it was from them I thought well now I want one <laughs> And yeah, the journey was just, I say horrific, might not seem horrific to others when I share it, but to me, it, it wasn't a smooth journey. I'd say it took 10 years to complete. With four children, I would have liked seven. Um, but it's just, I think I was kind of brilliant at falling pregnant, but not staying pregnant, to put it in a nutshell. Oh. So what was the plan with the doctors What when you were like, oh, no, wait, I don't want to go through menopause. I want to get pregnant. What was the, what did they do? Not a lot. (laughs) Not a lot, if I'm quite honest. Um, It was a really disappointing journey at times. And people have heard me speak before. It's one of the reasons why I actually went very much from the clinical career to the spiritual. But I think because clinically, I was kind of disappointed and I don't really like that word, but I was disappointed, disheartened, lots of other disses. And I think with every time I I had a loss and didn't feel supported that I kind of moved away from the clinical, but it's generally like you have to try for a year here in the UK. 
Um, and then if nothing happens, they then sort of still push you aside saying, well, keep trying or, well, you're not young, you're not old. Got to wait for you to come off the pill, which I had done immediately when I had the news about query early menopause. But there wasn't a lot of support. And really the support, because I guess I was falling pregnant, I didn't really get support to go down the IVF route because it wasn't that I couldn't fall pregnant. It was more that I wasn't staying pregnant. And so when I did get support, it was more support as in why why is she having these miscarriages? Put it into context. I had like miscarriage, my son, miscarriage, my daughter, then five consecutive miscarriages, our son, and then Daisy, who's a whole podcast showing herself, I'm sure, our miracle daughter at the end. Um, She was one of triplets, but it's it's just her sort of thing. Wow. And so... Yeah, so we've been pregnant. So it's quite, I suppose, if you look at the spiritual side of it, that I wanted like 11 children. That was my thing that I wanted. And I've had 11 pregnancies, but I only had four take home babies, as I'd call them. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose you could say, if you're trying to cling to the positive in the story, is um, I got what I wished for. I wanted to fall pregnant, have 11 pregnancies, but I didn't quite get the ending right, did I? (laughs) No. And that's, it's so hard. That's so hard. And it's not spoken about. I'm surprised clinically. So here, one of the things they would do is give you progesterone shots. Like there are some women that will have, and I'm not a doctor, but um, I know a woman who's going through this now, she got pre- she gets pregnant and then she has like 50 days of progesterone shots. And then weans off of that by using like a progesterone suppository because the risk of miscarriage is so high. And I've had three, I was pregnant seven times. I lost three. So, I mean, it's a really, really awful hard thing to go through. So. Yeah, I did have progesterone. I had um, the pill, progesterone. So I had that um, after my first one while I was trying for what is now poppy. Maybe that's where it comes from. Had the pop for poppy. (laughs) Um, But my body didn't tolerate it well. And I think with the blood test, I had a lot of blood tests over the years. um, It showed that I always had very low progesterone, which is one of the problems I probably struggled because I didn't like and see brilliantly. But if I did, I generally didn't say it. But I did have low progesterone. And I think that's something I've always had. One of those things that's just not spoken about. I mean, I started my periods, which I think is young, at age of 11. Yeah. And I'd have periods like every two weeks, which is why I went on the pill for so many years. Um, So I don't know if it was when I went on the progesterone pill to try and sort of help my fertility because of low progesterone, but my body didn't tolerate it well. There was a lot of like blood loss and it was just horrific. Weight gain, loads of things. I think the pill is horrific and that's a whole other podcast because that's definitely me on my bandwagon but I think it's awful and they did the same thing to me too when I was 15 oh we'll just I mean they do they I would love to say that it's changed because I'm 52 so when I was 15 they put me on a pill like and good luck and then but my daughter who's 30 when I brought her in you know 15 years ago they did the exact same thing and they're doing the exact same thing now and I think it's terrible for these young women who are who, who later, it may put a Band-Aid on the issue at the moment, but it's creating a lot of issues down the road. So mm-hmm. I, I understand that. And you were on it for a long time. You were on it for 20 years. Uh, well, I went on it when I was 16. And okay. I was just before I was 32, so pretty much half my lifetime, I'd been on the Holy pill. Cow. And then, yeah, and then it was said like, oh, we don't, you think you're now going through the menopause. But I think, I don't know if it was that or if it was just totally messed up from like, as I said, half my lifetime being on hormones right so obviously you know you have pregnancies that are struggling and your body's like nope we don't want any of that stuff in our body so you took the progesterone okay that makes sense and how horrific so was your husband what you're married this is a huge change from thinking you don't want to have kids to let's have 11. so (laughs) what was that process with him like and your relationship and then then i want to talk about the miscarriages also yeah so he, he just said like one would be enough um and they even now we kind of joke about it like when people say well, why did you have four children it's like well we just kept making them till we found one we liked um, <laughs> joke, we them all. um but he actually said 
like, I don't know, he's just amazing, my husband. Do you know what I mean? He's really, really lovely man. Like, I didn't meet him until I was like in my 30s, as I said. Um, but he was, like, even though I think you would thought one was enough, he was really supportive. And I think, like, if, if you ask any of the children or any of our friends, like, who's the most positive? It's always me, like, Mrs. Positive Changes. It's always me. But actually, during the fertility journey, it was probably him that was far more positive. Uh, yeah he came into his own and I remember during the five consecutive losses between Poppy and Milo I was like that's it I give up <laughs> no more and he was just kind of sort of like if you don't go after what you want you'll never have it you know and it's so true I've got it on my wall here somewhere like um yeah if you don't go after what you want you'll never have it and it is that and I'm such a nosy cow that I just thought I couldn't cope with not knowing and so yeah well he sort of said that and then you know I don't know if you did this Jen but we've, we used to pee on sort of like these um ovulation yeah. sticks yeah and um yeah and we was like peeing quick and try to make it sexy and it's never sexy because you're sort of like <laughs> just doing all these kind of like yoga positions aren't you to get the sperm in the right direction it's mental what things you do um <laughs> you know what I mean? sort of like peeing on a stick. it's not sexy you're peeing on a stick you're having sex you know and then you look like you're in a sort of some kind of accident your legs against the wall it's, it's horrific <laughs> all in the name of family and um but we didn't actually fall pregnant at a time when the ovulation stick said it was a good time. You know, we literally, yeah. he said, if you don't go after it, you'll never have it. And we just had kind of like, oh my God, that's a really sexy thing to say, spontaneous sex. And then we conceived Milo. <laughs> so, you know, I, I honestly think he was meant to, I was going to say meant to come. I meant my son was meant to come. There's no pun intended there. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's crazy. There's so much science and, you know, I went through uh, infertility up to IVF and there's all these things and they're checking the boxes and reading the book. And I got pregnant off the cycle, the cycle they had me on. I was highly medicated as medicated as you can get uh, with Clomid and Provera. And I just spontaneously popped off an egg. And when they're telling you like have sex every other day and take your temperature and do these positions and keeping the romance alive during that when you're like you need to perform in the next three hours please we need to yes yeah. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go stand on my head yeah you know, I mean <laughs> it's really challenging that process is really challenging how beautiful that he was so supportive after five miscarriages like, yeah. that's a lot that's a lot yeah so you bear in mind that he wasn't too bothered you know not, not that he wasn't too bothered but it wasn't his dream you know we all have our own dreams and yeah you know mine was to have this like large family like this extension of us kind of thing but I think that's the thing isn't it like we, we often joke like happy wife happy life and he knew it meant a lot to me and my journey and what I wanted for my life story and so you know he's been with me but now like you know obviously we're now complete with the four of us mm -hmm. and it's a gorgeous thing yeah I love that. So you had Milo and then, well, first of all, the six miscarriages prior to Milo, were you early on in pregnancy? Not that it makes it less of a miscarriage, but how far along were you getting in your pregnancy before you'd lose the baby? So they generally, because it turns out from some of the bloods, we had like um genetic counseling and a lot of blood tests and things like that so i have a blood disorder called factor 5 Leiden, which is probably one of the causes um of it because the placenta doesn't attach and it clots and there's not that sort of oxygen supply i guess so a lot of them would go quite early around six weeks six seven weeks but the one okay. before milo um which i think was one that nearly broke me but then i had my daisy journey um that was later that was nine weeks kind of thing um and that was horrible I mean they're all horrible um but that was a missed miscarriage and so there wasn't any signs really like in the past you know you start bleeding I know I was losing the child losing that life that chance that you know family member but with what would have been Oscar um it was a missed miscarriage so I was still feeling sick feeling really rough you know my body hadn't realized I wasn't pregnant and it, was, it was still going through the motions and I had to go for surgery to end that pregnancy yeah oh so hard so hard mm. um now so you have three and you know it's i think it's also challenging for women to talk about the fact that 
we're really ecstatic about the kids that we have and that there are women who can't have kids at all and how devastating that is or go through a lot of IVF. I mean, there are different, definitely levels of infertility, but for some women, I think it's hard to talk about how traumatic the loss is when you still have kids, which is one of the reasons yeah. I didn't talk about my miscarriages for a long time and they were traumatic. It was awful. But as women were kind of taught not to talk about it, uh, just move, like walk it off. It was only six weeks. Wasn't meant to be, you know, just keep going with life. Nobody stops and takes a moment to recognize that it's a loss of a child. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, when I wrote um, Good Grief, the yeah, said approach modern day grief healing, it's not just about like the grieving of someone that's had a life, like, you know, your partner or your grandparents. It is about like my miscarriages and things like that. And I, it, a big part of the book is about communication because people said, not going to say they said the awful thing, because rather they said something so I didn't feel invisible. But sometimes people just say things like you said, like, oh, obviously not meant to be. Obviously, it wasn't, right. you know, God's way and all that kind of thing. Um, or they say, at least you've got, you know, this one. At least you've right. got this one. You've got that. And I was just sort of like, as I said earlier, like grief is the loss of anything with which you have an emotional connection. And said to me, I'm still losing a dream. I'm still losing a life. Still losing a family member. And so I, it is heartbreaking. We don't talk about it. And I think because we don't talk about it, we don't have those conversations. So people still aren't saying the right thing or saying anything to us. We feel invisible and, you know, it's taboo, right? Some people won't even realize we're pregnant. Yeah. They don't know the loss we're going through. But yeah, when they see like, well, you know, some people have got no children. At least you've got three. But, you know, we've all got our own choices of love. You know? I've I think been judged quite a lot. I mean, you know, that time people said to me like, oh, well, you wouldn't know, would you? Because you've already got children. And I'm like... You have no idea what's going on in my world, you know, because I'm annoyingly positive and woohoo, you know, but so right. much loss. Yeah. And so much loss. So much loss. So, I mean, I'm glad that we're talking about that, that you can be grateful for the children you have and traumatize and feel lost. And I, you mentioned your book. So we're going to take a second right now. You're a published author of two books. So tell us about that. Tell us about the books. Yeah, so they're very different in, not in genre, because they're both self-help, but they're very different in the way I present them. So my first one was Positive Changes, a self-kick book. And as Jen knows, I went on to do Positive Changes, a self-kick podcast. And I wrote Positive Changes, a self-kick book after what is my daisy journey, our final child, because I just realized, oh my God, life's too short. I want to write a book. I'm going to write a book. And it's just all the feisty tools because I changed so much when I finally completed my final pregnancy. I let go of shoulds, people pleasing, you know, lots and lots of things. So Positive Changes, a self-kick book is full of tools, funny stories, truthful stories, you know, really gets you looking at life but then good grief the a to z approach of modern day grief healing is kind of like it's almost like my journey because i stem from a clinical background i was a chemotherapy nurse and end of life nurse for many years and then as i wasn't hurt feeling hurt clinically i then started to cling to anything like god spirituality anything and so good grief the a to z approach of modern day grief healing is a lot gentler it's not humorous it talks about how we're born into this life into a name that we don't choose um, about life lessons unlearning and it does talk about loss of dreams death dying communication and then half the book is the a to z approach the a to z of sort of healing tools so when you go through these losses whether that's you know death of a loved one or loss of a relationship confidence direction but it's a lot gentler and it's very spiritual the first one self-kick is very feisty oh well, shocking. shocking yeah and yes you had a podcast for close to two years I was on that podcast so that's amazing let's talk about the last pregnancy I lost twins at 16 weeks pregnant and when I started to bleed and we knew I was miscarrying the first thing the doctor said was we we might be able to save the other one right? And did not, we, we weren't able to save the other one, but I remember like, I remember feeling so physically and emotionally drained and overwhelmed. There was a point where I was like, I, 
I couldn't imagine them saving it. And I felt so awful. There was a part of me that was like, maybe it's not worth trying to save it. Like I, I felt like I was dying and that's a horrible thing. Like as a woman, it wasn't about not wanting the babies or not wanting the pregnancy. It wasn't about any of that. It was about feeling at such the end of my rope that I didn't understand how it was possible. And maybe that's apt because it wasn't possible. You know, maybe that was part of me intuitively knowing that it wasn't, I wasn't going to be able to save one, but you had triplets and you ended up having one. Take me through that journey. Cause that's, that's a tough yeah. one. So like, please, anyone that's listening, I know Jen, you're very Christian and I would say that I'm more spiritual. So please disregard anything that doesn't resonate no, with anyone. No, I love that. I love that it's so different. I love it. Go, jump oh. in. So before we had Milo, um, I had a vision of a baby girl to come and it was so, so clear. And then I had Milo and he was an emergency C-section. And I remember okay. feeling slightly stoned. And I said to my husband, did they just say it's a boy or am I really stoned? He went, no, <laughs> you know, kind of both. It's a boy and you're stoned from all the medicines. Um, and it made no sense. I had this vision, recurring vision for about 18 months of a dark haired baby girl to come. And it kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And in the end, I said to him, let's try this child. And that was Milo. So I figured it was just a slight, you know, miscommunication from spirit and myself. But then after Milo, this vision came back that I still had a dark hair baby girl to come. So we just started to try. I was like 40, thought we'd try, you know, if it happens, it happens, as we'd already learned on our journey. And so I felt pregnant, but I didn't really realize I was pregnant because I was just still bleeding at the time. So it was only when I started craving sweet chili chicken sandwiches about 9.30 <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm vegetarian. I was thinking, hang on a minute, you know. Um, I thought I'll just do a pregnancy test. And it came back that it was positive, but I'd had like two months of periods. And so we have to go in great quickly clinically if I fall pregnant because we know I had this blood disorder. Right. And so we went in and then I said, Well, I don't get how because I've been bleeding all this time, sort of thing. When they did the scan. There was still one sack there, but it didn't look like it was viable. And there was, I think there was a space where there might have been another one. So it might have been twins, may have been triplets. So we carried on with Daisy, what is now Daisy. Um, but it was a horrific pregnancy. Um, by 16 weeks, I was on seven different medications just to sustain the pregnancy. I'd had kind of weekly scans. I just kept bleeding still. It was just awful. I honestly thought I was making it up and you know like you said like have I got the strength to do this right and it turns out when we think we don't have the strength somebody throws us a curveball it generally takes a turn for a worse doesn't it and <laughs> our 20 weeks scan, <laughs> having not sort of like totally lost the plot at 20 weeks we had this scan and I was still um like clinical at the time I was a nurse and the sonographer was like I say scanning but she was literally pummeling and her face was gurning and the one thing we taught with nursing is make sure your face matches your words <laughs> but yeah. she was just looked like as in like oh this is not good so I was kind of like mouthing to my husband like I think something's wrong and because he knew the story you know all the way along he's like just try and be positive you know we've got this and in the end it was just so overwhelming I said to her it's like there's something wrong isn't there and she went are you clinically trained it's like yeah I'm one of your nurses here at the hospital and she goes, I'm so sorry, but there's something severely wrong that where I should be seeing health tissues, all I can see is this black mass. I need to get the consultant. So she went and got this consultant who was known to us throughout our journey, not continually, but we had met him before. And it was just so matter of fact, you know, and he just sort of said, yeah, you need to terminate right now. And I just couldn't even though I felt really broken from the really challenging pregnancy even though it didn't look good there were no like visible lungs and things like that I couldn't because I knew that my story is that generally I'm more likely to miscarry than to have a take-home baby and it was horrible bearing in mind I worked there there's just like just go into this room now and take these tablets kind of and I was like I can't and so I made the decision to you know have a scan again and I said to her like of this vision can you tell me if it's a girl or a boy because I said to Wes if it's a girl there's a high chance it's my vision and they make it 
and she couldn't tell because things were deformed there's this like mass in the lung the heart wasn't in the right place the diaphragm was compressed and I can't tell if I'm honest but if I had to have a guess I'll say it's a girl and I was like well then I'm going home because I think maybe she'll make it they didn't believe me they thought I was like mad as a box of frogs as we say here in the UK but I went home and I was broken. I thought, what the effing woman, do you know what I mean? They've literally said that this baby is not going to make it past 28 weeks, will never survive on the outside world. And you asked earlier, about how did my husband cope throughout all yeah. of my journey? And he'd been amazing. But with the daisy journey, I remember, like, it's not the house where we are now. But I walked into the kitchen after this sort of like news that we had to terminate his baby within. And he just slumped on the floor. And I was like, Christ, he's my rock. I, I don't have him. What do I have? I have this baby dying inside of me, three children relying on me, and my husband scrambled in a heap on the floor. And it was awful. And I didn't eat, I didn't drink for like days. I had my semicolon moment where I thought, I'm going to finish my life story. And um, Again, I write about this in Good Grief, the A to Z approach to modern day grief healing, because I think people can be, sometimes be quite judgmental about people who commit suicide. Mm. And I don't actually think there's a great difference between those who do and those who don't. I think the line between that choice gets so thin sometimes in these moments that, you know, I could have taken that choice. And I like to think that spirit's looking down on me. And I just, the vision of this baby girl started to come back. I wasn't eating, I wasn't drinking, I wanted to commit suicide. But this vision come back of this dark haired girl to come. So we got a second opinion, went to another hospital that didn't know me, got another okay. opinion. And they said, sometimes, it doesn't look good, but sometimes these babies with, it's called CCAM or CPAP, um, sometimes they make it. It'll be the hardest psychological journey you ever do. But if you're willing to take a chance, we'll take a chance on you. What do you say? And I uh, remember like a um, West family member said to me, like, sometimes a glimmer of hope, you know, they gave us a glimmer of hope. And she goes, sometimes a glimmer of hope's all you need. And that's all we had, Jen, was literally this kind of deformed looking child and a glimmer of hope that they said, like, if you get to 28 weeks, we would then fight every single thing. You need to get to 28 weeks. And we're 20, you know, okay. and time goes very slowly when you're going through trauma very slowly and also pregnancy it, pregnancy goes by it seems to take forever so yeah, yes least, that's hard okay <laughs> so, so they said get to 28 weeks and you know if we need to we'll get them out we'll, we'll, we'll fight for them it was awful they found another condition a pulmonary sequestration she had too much fluid which was overwhelming the heart as I said, her heart wasn't in the right place. It was awful, awful, awful. And because the hospital where I worked turned their back on me clinically, this is where I become who I am today, really, all the spiritual things. I did affirmations, I did yoga, I did visualization, I read books on miracles, I did daily prayer, I never told her she was ill, I did visualizations, I did absolutely everything spiritual because clinically I'd been dismissed, kind of thing. Right. And you know, I had Reiki healing, psychic surgery, you name it, I tried it because I had nothing to lose, you know. And she made it. I mean, she was amazing. Um, I didn't want to have any pain relief because I just thought she's got, like, hardly any... So basically, she hasn't got a left lung. She's got a right lung. Um, but I knew that I couldn't really have any sort of pain relief because it would suppress her breathing and I hadn't come this far to only come this far kind of thing so she was birthed naturally because I had that I don't know she's probably my loveliest labor if I was honest do you know what I mean because I just thought well you've got to go through it so I read a book bounced on a yoga ball did breathing you know and she was born and it was like 3 20 in the morning after she was born um as I held her I had that vision that I'd had for like 18 months that I had this baby girl to come so wow interestingly yes you're right i'm very christian i dreamed about two of my kids before they got here and after they got okay. here i realized why i dreamed about those two and the timing that they came like i would not if i if i hadn't done that i probably wouldn't have continued with foster care 
if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have stopped and changed something else in my life. Like it, it, so I, I think that that's very powerful. I think we're told in different ways. We're given hints and clues, wherever you believe that comes from. Um, I, I think sometimes we're given clues and maybe a, yeah. even a little peace too, or encouragement. So I love that. What, so you made it 28 weeks and then they wanted to do everything that they could. And she was born naturally. What ended up, and you lost her two siblings in this whole pregnancy process. What, and you know, what really makes me so pissed off <laughs> is that <laughs> they, they, you could have terminated before 20 weeks. And yeah. not had this child. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes medical, sometimes the medical professionals don't have all the answers and how awful. Tell me what, what were the issues? How old is she? What are continuing issues with her? Cause I didn't know this story at all. Oh, right. I thought you had. Um, yeah. So she had CPAP and pulmonary sequestration. So uh, just under four months, she underwent lung surgery and she had, so if you think your left lung's got two lobes, your right lung's got three, if I remember medically correctly. So she's only got one lobe on the left side around her heart. Her heart's still not quite in the right place <laughs> anatomically, but she's amazing. She's eight years old. She's an earth angel. She is the kindest person I've ever met. She's stunning. She looks like an angel. She's got these big blue eyes, bum length blonde hair, and she's just, oh she's just everything she's just amazing um I don't want to die tomorrow um <laughs> but if I died tomorrow uh, you know she completed my life story anything else after you know she was born has just been a bonus really but she's amazing so yeah she had major surgery at four months um but she's at school she's mainstream she's just absolutely amazing and she said the most stunning thing to me over the summer and you know I just said, you know, if you believe in anything in life, you know, believe in yourself, but also believe that we are more than our physical body because we have this thing in our house. If anyone remembers the old show, Little House on the Prairie, when they yeah. say good night, John Boy, at the end of yeah. the day, they're asked trying to say good night to all the children. Um, and so we get into this competition, say, like, good night, Daisy, I love you. She goes, good night, mum, I love you more. It's like, good night, Daisy, I love you more, I've loved you longer. And it just goes on and on. And then we do it with Milo. <laughs> um, and just recently, I say over the summer, I said to her like, oh, you know, good night. I love you. I love you more. And I said, oh, I loved you before you met me because, you know, you were my bump. And she goes, I've got a funny story about that, mum. She goes, just as you was about to have me, I nearly didn't come. And she goes, she's about to have me. And I jumped in. Did you know that? And Jen, I just burst into tears. And I went, yeah, I did know that. Because I think, how the hell can you make that up and she was just stood there and she's going like you're about to have me and I just jumped in isn't that funny that I nearly didn't come and I was just like she wouldn't have known that do you know what I mean and it's just as I say whatever you do in life always find something to believe in because I think we're so much more than our physical bodies in this day-to-day -day existence wow I want to wrap up I mean holy cow I don't know how to move <laughs> forward after that one yeah. I want to wrap up though. You do one-on-one -on -one coaching and you took a little bit of time off, you know, yeah. the pandemic and COVID changed everything. Well, I'm still trying to figure out who's doing what and where and in my own town. So <laughs> you took a little break and you're back to doing your coaching. You're going to start up in February ish of 2023. So tell yeah. me, let's end on how you can coach <laughs> other people and, and uh, that'll be great. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I've taken a break. I tried the old group coaching, but I, it's what I was saying about the podcast. I just love that one-to-one -one connection. So I'm going to do one-to-one -one coaching again, starting next year. And it's just a six-week program with me. And it is self-kick, um, positive changes. And it's people that have become stuck in life or had a loss. And I don't mean, I'm not a grief counselor, but I mean, the loss, like if you've lost direction, confidence your dreams if you've had that fertility journey your anger of family you just want to make that difference then I just work them and I want to say really authentically because that's a very overused word but I am a my grandparents used to call me WYSIWYG what you see is what you get and I just coach really authentically we just like meet talk tell it how it is 
and help them just to realize because I'm a great believer the answers are within us so yeah one-to-one -one coaching from the new year for those that are ready to make a change uh, Shelly thank you so much for being on I adore you thank you for sharing your story <laughs> thank you so much oh thank you for having me I was just so excited to reconnect I loved you being on my show I think you're this superwoman super <laughs> mom so thank you for allowing me to come on your show